Hello! Welcome to another episode of Pipe Corner. This is, this is going to be one of our more historical episodes of Pipe Corner. Uh, with me is friend of the channel, Jordan Kipp, Hello. who uh, I do reenacting with uh, in a couple of different time periods. Uh, usually 1812, but in the last year, mostly Swiss First World War. And uh, we're actually doing a thing right now, out in his backyard, setting up some tents, cooking some food, and just kind of shaking out the flaws for some of our uh, educational talk. Like, this is how we set up the tent, this is how it works, just to kind of get used to this stuff. It's really fun. And uh, we're going to have a bit of <coughs> smoke today. I'm going to be breaking in my new German-style church warden, which I'm really excited about. Just picked it up on Facebook Marketplace. It's got a windscreen, and it's got an extended stem, which is actually a separate piece. So the acrylic stem actually fits right into the end of uh, the shank there. So this piece can be omitted if you need to have a smaller travel pipe, which is kind of cool. But I'm going to give it a try today in its full glory. Uh, and I'm going to be smoking today some LJ Peretti Burlington Mix. This is a 2020 aged blend. Uh, I got about a pound of this. Uh, it's good stuff. I believe it's a honey infused burley, but I'll check my notes and I'll correct myself on, on screen if I'm wrong. So <clears throat> let me get this started. And uh, Jordan, how about you tell us what you're going to be smoking today? Okay. So what I have here is uh, an obnoxiously large wooden pipe that I found at a gun show. I know nothing about it. I couldn't tell you if it was meant to be a display piece or not, but it is, you know, it's fully open. It's smokable. I've smoked it before. And uh, the bowl is actually very tiny. It's like less than half the tip of my thumb for how big it is. But it's got this weird looking dragon on there that kind of looks Japanese or Chinese. I'm not sure. And uh, I think honestly, this is probably someone's like simple woodworking project and they just did some uh, fairly simple carvings in it. Like a high school project in yeah. the 70s when you can make tobacco themed products. Exactly, exactly. But when I, when I pull this out, it's just like the scene in, uh, in uh, Inglorious, uh, you know, expletive uh, <laughs> with the giant, what, what's the, the Sherlock Holmes pipe? What's that one called? That's a big uh, calabash. Yes, yeah. with the gigantic ivory or the, um, uh, the white cap the on it. On Mir it. Is it Meerschaum? Yeah. Okay. So it does, it does work. And I got mine packed in there. Um, and I am smoking uh, an LJ Peretti uh, St. James 2020, which you could probably extrapolate on if you need to. The St. James is a classic Louisiana St. James Perique style uh, tobacco. Mm -hmm. I got this, I got again a pound of this stuff because <clears throat> I couldn't get um, the other Sam Gow with St. James. So mm -hmm. whenever it comes into stock, I'm going to try to scoop it up. That is a fantastic pipe lighter. Yeah. I like that. Here you go. If you're ready. Yeah, it is quite a good lighter. For those of you who can't see, this is a classic Zippo. And it's got what appears to be a classic downward style pipe insert in it. But it is not a Zippo uh, butane style. It's, uh, I mean, um, Zippo fluid style. It's actually a butane filled insert. It's called a Z pipe. It fits inside all of the uh, Zippos, and I just find even as often as I use Zippos, I'll, I'll keep going to them and find that they've dried out over time. But so the, uh, the, the pressurized butane one, much better. I will also caution that this is the first time I have smoked this pipe. It's also the first time this pipe has been smoked, if I look at the interior of the bowl. Um, like Jordan, like you were saying with yours, you don't know why they would make something with a proper draft hole if it wasn't meant to be used. This as a proper draft hole seems to be meant to be used. Uh, if it's lacquered in some kind of arsenic based varnish, I think I'll find out pretty fast. And um, I will uh, put out a PSA about smoking pipes you don't really know about. So we'll see if that's necessary. We're but, gonna uh, avoid the brain damage as much as we possibly can. <laughs> but let's just sit back, enjoy a couple of drinks, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> have a smoke. Cheers. Cheers. Clink. <laughs> well, I've got this going now, and it seems fine. I've got no problems. It doesn't taste funky. It seems to be burning quite well. Mm -hmm. I'm to get this one going again. Really happy with this. I've been looking for something in a big, long German style since I started thinking about getting into First World War reenacting, because I knew that if I was going to reenact, I was going to have a pipe with me. It's almost a given. 
second choice of any time period for reenacting is well, what kind of tobacco pipe is appropriate. Yeah. Or, or hand rolled cigarettes or cigars. You have to. It's it's not the first line of research, but it's definitely something that has to be done. Mm. I mean, it's always fun when you can bring your other hobbies into to kind of mesh with each other. It's a lot of fun where I can say, okay, well, I'm doing historical reenacting. I'm doing a, an 1812 period event. What kind of historical cocktail or punch could I bring to it? What kind of historical tobacco or pipe could I bring to it? And I get to overlap these things. Um, I imagine it's much the same, Jordan. You were into historical um, reenacting and into firearms. Are you into the one because of the other? Uh, which way is it just you're happy with both and you get yeah. to have some fun with, with that either way? It's, it's both, yeah. yeah. I think technically I got, I, I purchased my first uh, 1812 musket a few months before I actually started reenacting, but it, it all just went together. Mm. They, really, uh, they really hooked me in. <laughs> hmm. It's also fun in 18, uh, no, not 1812, in uh, First World War reenacting, I finally get to bring in one of my other, other hobbies, which is photography, which you can't do pre, uh, reason, you can do it reasonably pre-1890s. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, you could try and do some Roger Fenton Crimean War photography on glass plate with a big baggage train and your big wagon, but I'm not going to get that into it. Because, you know, while I was worried about arsenic on the pipe, I would have to worry about if I was doing glass plate daguerreotype, I'd have to worry about actual cyanide in the process. And I don't want to have to deal with that when I'm out in the field somewhere. So. At about the time they started to get the, the vest pocket folder camera that the soldiers were using in the trenches in the First World War, that's about as comfortable as I am with bringing historical photography into my reenacting. Well, the tiny little ball, I have to keep this going. It doesn't want to stay lit. But <laughs> I'm finally picking up some of the flavors that aren't, you know, uh, wood shop wood shavings <laughs> but it is nice so we're gonna show you a little bit of the food that we're making later when it's all done we're making a braised beef and polenta so let's uh, get back to you when that's cooked all right so tonight we're going to be making some braised beef and polenta a wonderful uh, swiss italian traditional meal and because we cook with wine we start with the wine cheers So we're going to go with a mix of fresh and canned vegetables today. Uh, a lot of meals that would have been prepared in the field would have been a combination of food that was issued and food that was scrounged. And because we're not being too delicate about things, this is just going to be coarse, home-style chopped get it done kind of kind of vegetable prep there it goes so we got some onion Got some garlic. I'm glad for the breeze out here. This onion re usually really gets at my eyes. Try to ignore the completely period inaccurate Apple Watch tan. Uh, 
like I said, just nice thick coarse chopping. Stage hand. Thank you. So that's all the fresh veg uh, prepared there. Next we're going to move on to the canned veg. And as we discovered last time we were using the Swiss Army knife for the uh, can opening function, it's not as intuitive as you might think, but we figured it out. We kept trying to cut up with the blade, and that is the direction in which the blade collapses. So it kept folding on us. But it is a lifting action with the cutting occurring behind this fulcrum point. Look at the labels off these cans, I'm not even sure what we're putting in here. But this would appear to be corn and peas. And this one would appear to be diced tomato. So that'll be nice. And the main course of this dish is going to be the diced beef. Uh, should be plenty here. I was gonna try to get some sausages, but I couldn't get my hands on some of the Swiss servalat sausages, which are kind of the, uh, the national sausage. If you look up the Swiss sausage crisis, I think of the 1980s, I'll correct myself on the notes if I'm wrong, it is one of the funniest headlines for a national crisis to strike a country, the sausage crisis. Look it up. Okay, so we're gonna start to add our vegetables here. Should be nice and hot in here. A lot of onion and pepper in there. Add in our carrots and peas. And some tomato. You really get the nice cast out of your peas. <laughs> we always learn that. Add a bit of salt in there, maybe a bit more. I'm always sparing with salt when uh, vegetables or food have come out of a can because you never know how much they were salted to begin with. Pepper, though, I am never stingy on. So we're going to let the beef uh, be itself a little bit rare, not rare, but uh, we, don't, we don't want to overcook it in this particular dish. So I'm going to let the vegetables sit like this for a little while and then when we start the polenta I'll put the beef on. All right, now we're going to add some meat. Add in all of our beef here. Not that. All of our beef here. Give that a good stir. And then we'll sacrifice a little bit of our red wine to flavor that up nicely. All right, now we'll start on the polenta. All right, so we're gonna do our polenta now. We're gonna start by adding three cups of water. Oh, it's sizzling, it's ready to go. Maybe not three cups of water. <laughs> we'll get more. Damn Swiss canteens. And most of a cup of polenta. 
That's like a three to one ratio there. Now, some train, some schools of thought for polenta say that you should be stirring this constantly for 45 minutes. I'm not sure if any of those schools have cooked polenta over a wood stove. I would be interested in knowing if they had. Uh, the last time I made this dish over regular electric range, I did constant stirring or near constant stirring for about two minutes. And uh, then I just covered it and came back to it as necessary. So we're just going to let this start to soak and it'll thicken up and become a nice porridge consistency. Kind of like a cream of wheat, but not quite. Kind of like a couscous, but not quite. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good. I do like this. So we're just going to let this go for a few minutes. All right, we're just about ready to have some dinner. We're just going to add the last step, which is the cheese stirred into the polenta. This is just a Parmesan. You got a Parmigiano Reggiano mix. You got Asiago. Any kind of a hard, sharp cheese is going to be great with this. But really, you can put anything you want. Um, I'd imagine even a brie cheese would give it a really di a different flavor, a different texture. So that should be. That should be great, right? Just like that. And once it's melted, we're going to enjoy it. Well, we've got our meal here ready to go. We've got our sleeping quarters set up behind us, ready to go. We're going to tuck in, have a little bit of food. Let's see how this turned out. We've got some of the cheesy, creamy polenta. <laughs> there you go. Don't be shy. Oh, it's been so long since I've had good polenta. There you go. Beauty. Oh, yeah. And we've got some lovely braised beef. There's a lot of liquid in here. It didn't cook off quite as much, so it's kind of more like a stew, but I know that the beef is nice and soft, so let's give you a bit of stuff there. Yeah. I like my food not touching, so. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Don't get into an army. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Oh, that looks good. Oh, yeah. That's going to be amazing. It's going to be a nice meal. And we've got, because it's an Italian regiment, an Italian meal, we've got some Italian wine oversized because we had to use some in the cooking. We needed to have enough left over. So we're going to have our dinner here, then we'll check in with you once we've finished eating. And uh, we'll start getting into how we're going to set up our tent. So, cheers. Cheers. Clinkies. Clinky. See you in a bit. Thank you. <sighs> so, we've had some, uh, some dinner. We've had some smokes. We've had uh, a couple of drinks. We finished off the wine. Now we're moving on to... Some Pernod. I know it's a little weird. We've gone from Italian food, Italian wine, German pipe, and now French liquor, but uh, oh boy. That's uh, what it is to be Swiss. Jeez. The crossroads of all those cultures. Mm -hmm. So we're going to sit out here and enjoy ourselves uh, around the fire, have a couple drinks, and uh, then we're going to get on into the tent and I'll set up the camera in there so you can kind of see how our layout is. We're both going to try to start out um, sleeping with what they would have been kitted with. But yeah. we've got a couple extra blankets just in case we give up halfway the other night. It's, it's, going, see how down it goes. To, uh, it's going down to what, six or seven degrees tonight? So. Yeah, so that'd be I mean, six, five or six degrees Celsius is probably the low. But we've, we've tented in colder weather. Though. Yeah, but well, cheers. Let's uh, mm. to a good night. Excellent. Do our best. Oh, it's got a nice bite. <laughs> oh, it's sweet. Mm. Licorice. All right, well, we'll catch you in the tent. Cheers. Well, this is us inside the tent. It's pretty roomy. Uh, four is out for two, for two people. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got our Swiss Army blanket. Got a 
pack. Spare clothes as a pillow. Got my coat to throw over me, over the, my upper, upper body. If I got too cold, I would have got a spare blanket. Mm -hmm. But we'll see how we do. See how miserable we are by the morning. We'll give you a, a report after sunrise. Exactly. Good night. Go have a good one. <sighs> Well, we made it till dawn. Uh, at least I made it until dawn. Jordan decided that he'd had enough of the uh, chattering squirrels and had to go inside uh, around about three or four in the morning, I think it was. Uh, so <laughs> we got to brave the outdoors and try the experience. And although it wasn't as comfortable as I was used to, as I'm used to in a lot of reenacting uh, these days, sleeping on a, an army cot inside of a full-sized canvas wedge tent. Uh, being in a tent that was open at both ends and was fairly low to the ground and on the grass without a ground sheet was actually less wet from condensation and less buggy than I had expected it would be. So that was a plus. Uh, however, the ground is just as hard no matter what you're sleeping under, no matter where you're sleeping. It's, it's just as hard as the ground is going to be, and it's nothing compared to a cot. So I'm thinking that maybe I'll be bringing uh, a bit of a padded ground sheet to sleep on next time at the very least. Another thing that can be done with those kinds of tents, you saw that the Zelpon came down right to the ground at a fairly low angle because the poles were only so high. Another thing that they would have done for more long-term fortifications or long-term um, sleeping arrangements is they would have dug down uh, a couple of feet and lined the inside of the hole that was the length of the Zeltbahn structure with sandbags and then they would have been able to put uh, a double decker like a, a, a um, cot a uh, bunk bed style cots run down the length so that you could step down into your Zeltbahn uh, structure and then they would also would have had a wood stove at the one end like we had our wood stove but it would have been inside the Zeltbahn and you would have run the chimney pipe out through the sod and up so that it didn't come in contact with the, with the Zeltbahn and so there's no, no risk of fire there. And th they would have had a nice covered, insulated, warm sleeping arrangement. So that's something that we are looking at if we're going to be going down to the reenactment event in Newville, Pennsylvania, uh, which we may be going to this fall if COVID concerns start uh, to relax. Uh, otherwise, we'll be hoping to go there uh, in the spring. We have two, two major events a year, and we have been invited uh, whenever COVID allows that to, to be possible. So, bottom line, cooking, fun. Smoking, drinking outside in these uniforms, these tents, fun. Sleeping, adequate. We can get by. Uh, so we rather like the idea of being able to walk on to an event. A lot of reenactors tend to drive on with big trailers and all this stuff. And you, as a reenactor, it's much like a goldfish and you start to expand into the space that you have. You fill up your car. Once you get one more thing too much for your car, you get a trailer. And then you fill up your trailer and you end up bringing all kinds of things. So we think that it would be really cool and fairly unique uh, to have the ability to park our cars in the parking lot at an event, at a timeline event or an education event or a reenactment event, and be able to just walk on with our food, our clothes, our uniform, our tents. The only thing we couldn't walk on with would be the wood stove, but uh, for a, a smaller event, if we don't need a wood stove, we can bring on just cold plowman style food. We could just walk into the event reenact for the weekend and walk off and that would be a very appropriate uh, accurate depiction of how the soldiers would have comported themselves back in the day and that would be a lot of fun so i am going to have myself a nice fresh cup of coffee after a long night <sighs> and i'm going to catch up on the sleep that I didn't get in that Zeltbahn. So for everyone out there in YouTube land, this is Cigar and Bar. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. If you'd like to see more of uh, activity with the Swiss, the Swiss have also started their own YouTube channel. I'm gonna put a link up there 
to our 25 kilometer route march that we did with Verestalika, which is a uh, army surplus and outdoors chain in Finland. Uh, there's more information about that on the video. It's a lot of fun. It's a bit of a long video. We did uh, shoot over the course of a whole day where we walked 25 kilometers in our full uniforms. Uh, lots of fun and lots of information about the uniform that we didn't get into today. So if you want to see that, it's up there. It's really cool. Uh, I really enjoyed doing that and shooting that video. Uh, so we're going to let you go and I wish you the best of days and more interest in history and historical reenacting in the future. Cheers.